Okay, I think we have a very uh, full agenda today, so I'm just going to get us started. Um, good morning again. It's, it's Tria Case here from City University of New York, um, and we're joined this morning with Bob Zalosh, Milos Prashovsky, uh, and Alfonso Barda, who are going to be talking to us uh, within the concept of the bucket of application of data. Um, I want to remind everybody that um, there is a Google Doc, um, and, and if you have thoughts or questions, uh, make sure you're you're utilizing that document. I also want to remind those of you who would like to join the conversation on the 27th um, that you register uh, so that we can make sure we we're counting and having the right number of uh, seats in that room. Um, and also because today is going to be so uh, packed, um, make sure that you're thinking about any questions or conversations you want to have on the 27th. Again, reaching back to us, um, and we'll be probably taking a lot of the questions and conversation related to this topic um, on the 27th. Um, and uh, I guess with that, um, I'd like to just get us started and introduce Bob Zalosh, who's going to be talking to us about deflagration hazard characterization. So Bob, um, take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to start by thanking the uh, TRIA and the other webinar organizers for inviting me and uh, my colleagues, Alfonso and Milos, to present our approach to using UL9548 data for fire and deflagration hazard characterization. Our ultimate objective is to prevent the a kind of event that would uh, de destroy a battery energy storage system and uh, breach the container and threaten adjacent uh, storage systems, as occurred uh, in a power plant near Brussels in November of 2017, photo in the lower right corner, and also uh, to prevent a uh, battery fire from propagating through a large building and uh, jeopardizing the operation of a energy producing facility, as occurred in a fire on the North Shore of Oahu in uh, 2012, and as shown in the lower left corner. Next, please. The this slide shows a uh, simple sketch of a UL9540A module level uh, test uh, facility as uh, provided by Adam and his colleagues. The, uh, uh, the test starts by initiating a uh, runaway event at one cell in a module, and uh, the objective is to observe the subsequent uh, potential threat for the runaway to propagate through the module and to generate the kinds of fire and effluent gases that might jeopardize the surrounding facility. Uh, as you can see in the diagram, the, uh, the effluent gases are captured in a smoke collection hood and an exhaust duct. The exhaust duct is uh, equipped with instrumentation to measure the velocity and temperature of the exhaust gases and to provide a sample of the gases to an FTIR analyzer to determine gas composition and, and volume. Next, please. So the fire hazard is in this sort of a setup is characterized primarily by the heat release rate, which is calculated online with the UL software in real time. The fire heat release rate is the single most important parameter to characterize the size and threat of any fire. And it can also be used with fire protection engineering uh, algorithms and correlations and the like and general know-how to determine the potential for fire spread and for the threat to the surrounding enclosure and to any nearby occupants or target uh, vulnerable equipment. The deflagration hazard in this uh, test uh, setup is characterized by the module vent gas composition and volume and how to use that information in relation to the insulation, enclosure, volume, and strength. And I'll show that in, the re uh, in most of the remaining slides in this uh, presentation. Next, please. 
This is a uh, diagram of uh, the unit level test setup in which a fully equipped uh, energy storage system unit is uh, located adjacent to three mock-ups of other uh, BESS units and also near a instrumented wall section. So the instrumentation in this whole setup is located under the same uh, calorimetry collection hood and exhaust duct to provide similar uh, measurements of that can characterize the uh, heat release rate and also the instrumentation on the walls and on the targets can uh, provide a measure of the threat of fire spread to those units. Next, please. Next again, good. So the wall temperature and heat flux uh, characterize the threat to the wall nearby the uh, unit that's um, beginning the thermal runaway. The target, uh, other units, the measurements of the temperature and heat flux impinging on those units characterize the threat to damaging them, those units and spreading the fire. There's an observation of flame outside the BESS unit. And next, and a characterization of reignition is just by observation over the duration of the test. If there's a uh, delayed second ignition after the initial runaway goes to conclusion. Next, please. The, uh, th this slide provides at least one person's uh, approach to how this uh, unit level fire test data can be used for fire protection determinations. So uh, it uh, certainly can be used directly to determine if the fire will be limited to a single module or if there's a threat to the adjacent modules. It probably can be used along with appropriate fire models, fire protection engineering models, to assess the threat of the module fire to the room and the enclosure boundary fire resistance, to assess the approximate time of fire de detection for installed thermal detectors, such as closed link sprinkler heads, and possibly for smoke detectors. And most of the time, in most cases, it cannot be used to determine the effectiveness of fire suppression systems. In order to make that determination, an installation scale fire test with an actual installed suppression system will be required. However, as the last bullet says, the comparisons of the unit level fire test data from different tests should be useful in projecting the relative challenge of a BESS to a fire suppression system that has been tested at installation scale. Next, please. Okay, this uh, shows a uh, sketch of a, a unit, um, sorry, of a, a module uh, going, undergoing the uh, module level test and at the point where the uh, cell vents or the cell ruptures have now produced a cloud of uh, flammable gas and that cloud is rising and being captured in the hood and in the exhaust stuff that you see in the uh, photograph. Next, <coughs> here is some sample data provided by Adam <coughs> from UL showing the kind of gas compositions and volumes uh, measured in a, uh, in a preliminary uh, test. And you can see that the gases include various hydrocarbons, acetylene, ethylene, methane, propane, include uh, other gases, uh, carbon monoxide, important gas, and uh, carbon dioxide, a combustion product, and uh, other potential uh, electrolyte decomposition products that you see uh, listed here. And uh, the, the analysis includes a, uh, a calculation of the total hydrocarbon uh, production, uh, which is an important uh, parameter to characterize the overall deflagration hazard. Next, please. Here's a uh, sketch of a, uh, a module uh, undergoing a, a generation of volume of 
uh, effluent gases, flammable gases included uh, in an installation. And uh, the question posed on the slide is, does this produce a deflagration hazard in the surrounding enclosure? I'll provide two different approaches to answer that question. The first approach is sort of the code-based approach uh, that's based on 25% of the gas, flammable gas, lower flammable limit, LFL. Next. Uh, so the basic criteria is if the ratio of the flammable gas volume measured in the 9548 test to the in overall enclosure volume, if that uh, ratio is greater than 25%, then per the code uh, uh, prerequisites, the, there is a deflagration hazard in the closure. The, ba the basic idea is that you imagine the flammable gas cloud occupying about one quarter of the overall enclosure volume and such that in that one quarter of the enclosure volume, you do have a concentration at or above the LFL that can be prone to a deflagration and explosion if it were to be ignited. Uh, next, please. A more fundamental approach uh, to answer this question about whether there's enough flammable gas to produce a deflagration hazard is to, uh, uh, here, here you see the flammable gas occupying a small uh, fraction of the enclosure volume. Next, please. The uh, premise is that this gas mixture forms a local flammable mixture at or near the stoichiometric concentration and is then ignited by a spark emitted from the module. Next, please. And this sort of uh, deflagration is what we call a partial volume deflagration and can be protected sometimes more easily than a full volume. Next, please. This is um, the pressure developed in a partial volume deflagration can be calculated by this equation shown in the slide. The parameters are the, uh, the ratio of the flammable gas volume to the enclosure volume, XPV, and Pmax, the uh, closed vessel explosion pressure. And uh, using the uh, calculated PPV, you can compare it to, next please, the next slide shows some representative damage threshold pressures for different structures. And they range from as little as 0.1 or 0.2 PSI for gas breakage on up through wall cracking, including some, some stronger walls, concrete and cinder block walls, and pressures of 1.8 to about 3 PSI, and entire building collapse, 3 to 4.5 PSI, and then structural steel suffering major damage. Depending on the installation, you can uh, you can uh, choose one of these dam one or more of these damage threshold pressures, and compare the calculated partial volume deflagration pressure to these pressures to determine if there's enough flammable gas volume emitted during the thermal runaway to threaten uh, if, if ignited delayed ignition to threaten the enclosure. The last slide, next please, shows the results of uh, my calculation for some rep some two different cases with different values of Pmax and different stoichiometric concentrations. The y-axis shows what's the ratio of the flammable gas volume to the enclosure volume that would produce pressures. The abscissa, the x-axis, shows the damage threshold pressure in PSI. So you can use this kind of data to determine if the results in terms of flammable gas generation in the 9540A module test or unit test will threaten the enclosure. I'm going to stop there and allow uh, the next person up on our presentation list to tell you about explosion protection for deflagration hazards. Thank you. All right. Uh, th thank you, Bob. Uh, so I'll be uh, speaking next. My name is uh, Alfonso Ibarreta. I work at Exponent, um, and I'm a member of the NFPA uh, Technical Committee of the uh, Explosion Protection Systems, along with uh, uh, Professor Bob Zillash. Next, please. So I'll talk about the uh, uh, how do you protect against an explosion. 
And there, there's really two ways. You can either prevent an explosion from occurring or you can mitigate the, uh, the effects of an explosion. Uh, so for an explosion to occur, you basically need to have all five components of the explosion pentagon. So in the pentagon, you have the three components that you have in the fire triangle. So you have your, your fuel, your oxidizer, and in this case, a competent ignition source, which would be a, a, a source of heat in the fire triangle. Uh, but in addition, you would also need the dispersion of the fuel prior to ignition and uh, confinement or congestion. So in, as an example, I have in blue, uh, if you have a, a propane explosion in an enclosure, uh, you feel, of course, with the uh, propane air is probably your oxidizer, and you need to disperse the fuel within 2 to 10% by volume. Uh, in terms of ignition source, you really don't need much to ignite a, a flammable gas. So it's a very low threshold for ignition. And then finally, uh, the walls of the enclosure. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, so to give you an idea of the hazard uh, that could be uh, posed by the, the gases of gassing of a battery, uh, Exponent did some testing a while ago where they, we um, charge lithium polymer batteries to 100% state of charge, SOC, and we also overcharge them to 150%. We took the gases and we compared the maximum pressure in a 20 liter uh, combustion vessel and also the uh, DBDT as a, a function of fuel concentration. So the left plot shows you the maximum pressure, and we're comparing to methane in green and hydrogen purple. And you can see that number one, the uh, the peak pressures are fairly similar with the three, uh, but the the uh, lithium battery uh, gases actually have a, a pretty wide range of of combustibility. And on the right, it shows you that the DBDT gives you a sense of the reactivity of the fuel. It it's uh, uh, it depends on the burning velocity, so it it shows you that uh, it is more reactive than methane, uh, less reactive than hydrogen. Uh, so there is a clear uh, explosion hazard for the use of gas. Uh, next, please. So, oh, I didn't show, uh, can you zoom out of your uh, cutting off a little bit? I'm cutting off some? Um, yeah, there should be a, there's a, an item that has been cut off at the bottom. Oh. Is this better for this one? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll just briefly uh, go through the, uh, the NFP69 code, which is a standard explosion prevention systems. Uh, Bob Zelage will talk about NFP68, which is a standard of explosion uh, protection by defragation venting. And these two are complementary standards. Uh, what I do need to emphasize is that the, these standards do not tell you when you need to be using certain mit mitigation. Uh, there, there's really no such thing as a an FPS 68 or 69 compliant battery system. It's just uh, these methods when when a separate NFPS standard may say you need to protect your enclosure via either NFPS 68 or 69. It's really up to the user to determine what method they would like to use to protect the system. And, and then these codes would tell you uh, the minimum uh, requirements for that protection method. Uh, so, so the methods are really sort of summarized here. Uh, 69, you don't actually have an explosion because there, there's no rupturing, uh, but what you're doing is that you're preventing a defecation or you're mitigating a defecation. In FPS 68, you actually have bursting of the uh, relief vent, really 
so, so there is an explosion occurring that you're opening it. And they, the final goal, forget get the plot on the right. If you have an unmitigated explosion, you would reach a very high peak pressure, maybe up to a bar. And uh, what you want to do by these methods is to either not have ignition or reduce the maximum uh, pressure so that it's below the ultimate strength of the equipment. Next, please. So uh, NFP 69 uh, has several chapters, 7 through 14. And each of these uh, tell you how to perform a, a separate uh, type of mitigation. Uh, so the, the first three, three, seven, eight, nine, are really prevention of a defecation by preventing ignition of the gas. Uh, 11 and 12 are uh, how to prevent a defecation from propagating to, to an enclosure that you want to protect. And then 10, 13, or 14 are how to mitigate the identification so that even though you have ignition and propagation, that you're not going to burst your vessel. Uh, so in the next few, few slides, I'll just go through a, a few of the main ones. And I'll, I'll talk about how the cell level test uh, can be used to uh, dictate uh, what method can be used. Next. So the first one is uh, accident concentration reduction, which uh, may or not be feasible uh, for for uh, certain designs. But basically, all you're doing is you're, you're reducing the amount of oxygen where the gases are of gassing. So if you can somehow blanket uh, your your batteries so that the off gassing occurs in a reduced oxygen atmosphere. Uh, so you would need to know the limiting oxygen concentration, or LOC is for that gas. Uh, that is not currently measured uh, in uh, UL 9548. According to NAP 69, you can either use an ASDM standard uh, 2079 to obtain that information, or you can get uh, use a, a different method and then uh, have a, a sort of a fudge factor uh, by subtracting 2%. Uh, and the code also gives a, a table of LOC values for uh, different reference fuels. Uh, so, so basically, you start with an atmosphere of 21% oxygen. And then as you add either nitrogen or CO2, you would want to be below uh, the, the value on that table. So for methane, 10% uh, for nitrogen. CO2 is more effective at quenching the flame, so you can be up to 12.5%. Next. Uh, next one is combustible concentration reduction, and that depends on the uh, lower flammability limit or L level of the mixture uh, that that is currently measured uh, at the cell level for the old 95 uh, you can also estimate it in a 69 and uh, basically uh, 69 assumes that you have a, a very well mixed volume uh, so that you know what the concentration is at all points and it requires that you are below 25 uh, percent of the LFL or if you have a system, and normally this is where you're uh, flowing gases and you're using monitoring and uh, interlocks, you need to be below 60% of the LFO. Uh, but of course, as Professor Silas uh, was indicating, uh, this is really not, not uh, feasible when you have a, a portion of the volume that could be combustible within a much larger volume. Next. Uh, ignition control is something that is included in the standard, but normally, uh, according to the NFPA, it's a necessary control, but not sufficient to prevent or to mitigate uh, a hazard. In this case, it's not really feasible. 
uh, because the battery itself is going to produce ignition uh, via the heating in the sparks. Next. Uh, passive isolation, we have uh, used this in the past. We, we have worked with uh, uh, clients that uh, have used uh, uh, basically flame arresters to try and, and prevent a failure in, in one module from uh, spreading to, to other modules. Um, and there, there's two type of, types of uh, flame arresters. One is the end of line shown the uh, top right. Basically, you, you have a, a combustible gas going through the arrestor and you want to prevent the, the flame from entering into the enclosure. And then you have the, uh, the second one is the inline defragation where you have a, a combustible mixture that is burning and it's going to uh, uh, reach the flame arrestor and you want to quench the flame so that you don't have Flame shooting out of your of your system. Uh, so the second one is the one that we have looked at in the past, trying to quench the flame so that you have uh, hot gases exiting your module, but you don't have an actual flame that could impinge onto their module. Uh, so, so in that case, the information that we have looked at is the the rate of gas generation, which in the current UL standard uh, you do measure the total volume of gases produced, uh, but there is in the report, uh, you're not uh, divulging how long it takes to produce the gases. So I think that would be a uh, useful information that would allow you to estimate the, the generation rate. Uh, the burn gas temperature, of course, is important, and that can be estimated uh, according to the Pmax value which is uh, in the uh, produced in the UL standard report. Um, the auto ignition temperature may be something that you may need to know if you want to uh, prevent reignition of the unburned gas. So if you quench the flame, you need to make sure that uh, at some point when it goes to the arrestor, it's not going to be heated beyond the auto ignition point and, and reignite. Uh, and then found the, the quenching diameter uh, for the flame arrestor, uh, that, can, that can be estimated from the uh, burning velocity, which is something that is going to be provided in, in the report. Next. Uh, another method discussed in 69 is active uh, suppression, uh, where you have a suppressant chemical that is inserted very quickly into enclosure. So you need to be able to detect an incipient defecation within your enclosure and, and then very quickly inject this chemical and then uh, that will suppress the combustion. So if you, if you look at the, the schematic on the top, you see the times for uh, detection suppression are in the order of uh, tens of milliseconds. And it's, it's been used in the combustible dust industry. And below is a sample suppression plot where you have detection of a uh, defecation, uh, the HRD, which is the high uh, rate of discharge uh, suppression system. And, and that will limit the maximum pressure. You still have a peak in this case of about 3.5 psi g, but if you were to actually combust the entire volume, uh, the pressure may actually go up to 100 psi g. Uh, but for these, uh, you you actually do need to test the system with the actual fuels fuels that you are using. So I don't think that the UL test that I would would really give you too much information, I think you actually would have to do uh, some sort of additional testing. Uh, next. And this is my final slide. So pressure uh, containment, um, where uh, you would just make your enclosure strong enough to withstand the maximum expected pressure. And you would limit it to either 0.5, 
being able to have a deformation of enclosure but not bursting uh or or i mean uh, to to not have deformation or to have deformation but no burst so you do require to know the pmax which is measured by the u.s standard and uh if you can go one slide more so this is the uh, the equation in 69 so you have two different equations whether you want deformation but not rupture uh, or you don't want deformation. So you you would design your system so you have a, a uh, designed pressure uh, PM AWP according to, to the SME code. And that depends on the R is really Pmax uh, or it depends on, on Pmax and then your ultimate stresses. All right, uh, that, that's all the slides I have. So now I'll I'll turn it back to Bob for the NFPA 68 slide. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna run through this, the more visual aspects uh, of this, but uh, cut short the, uh, the technical uh, equations and details of the event design. So the basic idea is to uh, determine how much uh, vent area is needed and other vent parameters to prevent the uh, unacceptable damage to the enclosure during a deflagration. And as the asterisk says, the deflagration is a flash fire or explosion in which the flame propagates through the flammable gas mixture at a speed less than the speed of sound in that gas mixture. If it were to propagate at a speed Faster than speed of sound would be called a detonation, but virtually almost all accidental uh, explosions are deflagration, so we are covering the overwhelming majority of expected explosion conditions by looking at deflagrations. Next, please. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a isometric view on the right of a, a unit uh, level a 9540A test in which you can see one uh, module is uh, undergoing a, um, a runaway, the results of a runaway that in this case is uh, proceeded to a flaming. You can see the three mock-up tar uh, target modules and the uh, corner uh, walls, and the whole test is conducted under the, the hood, as you see. On the left, you see the examples of the uh, generation rates of the various gases uh, shown in the legend. And the point here is that all these generations occur as spikes or uh, as, as pulses. And uh, due to the venting, sudden venting of the gas or sudden breaching of the, uh, the gas wall or some enclosure boundary. And so uh, a lot of that occurs prior to flaming and we want to prevent a delayed ignition Sorry, we want to prevent damage caused by a deflagration that results from delayed ignition of these flammable gas generations. Next, please. Okay, so I do want to show you that what a deflagration looks like uh, as looking inside the enclosure. So this is a, show a series of, of slides starting, uh, of a uh, ethylene air mixture vented explosion test that uh, I and my colleagues did about 40 years ago. In this case, it was an ethylene air mixture and an eight cubic foot vessel that was made out of polycarbonate wall so we could look inside the vessel as uh, filmed with a high speed video camera. You can see on the one slide, or one frame, that the ignition has occurred, the residual white in the center of the, uh, of the ball of flame. That, this, uh, in this case, ethylene blue ball of flame is expanding spherically outward in the enclosure. At this point, the vent panel has not opened. So on the first slide, it's just it's an in, uh, intact and closed uh, uh, deflagration. But uh, next, please. In the subsequent slides, uh, frames, excuse me, you could see what the vented explosion looks like. The ball of flame continues to propagate outward in the enclosure, but it also, the burn gas wants to, and now since the vent is open at the bottom of the vessel, the burn gas wants to flow out of the vessel, and unburned gas is flowing out of the vessel as well. But the, uh, the important point is that the, 
the flame propagation continues. So until in the fifth slide, the middle bottom middle, you see the flame has now occupied virtually the entire enclosure. So during deflagration venting is uh, can be an excellent tool for preventing damage to the enclosure, but it's not going to prevent flame propagation throughout the enclosure, or at least as much of the enclosure as a partial volume deflagration will allow. And so uh, there's a threat of thermal damage and, of course, uh, severe injury to anybody who's unfortunate enough to be in the enclosure, vented enclosure. Finally, in the last frame, you see the uh, deflagration is now over and you just have some residual burn gases uh, in the enclosure cooling off. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is a uh, sort of my conception of a vented uh, deflagration at a battery energy storage facility. As you can see, the burning is occurring in the facility from the flammable gases generated by these various modules. And at this point, one of at least two vent panels has deployed so that there's a flame jet emitted outside the enclosure uh, as well as the burning in the enclosure. Next, please. Here are some actual uh, vent panel installations, uh, three different installations. You can see hinge vent panels, uh, frangible vent panels that are scored to, to uh, tear open, and some that are designed to fly off intact in different uh, types of enclosures. The basic vent design in 68 is to determine what the required total vent area is, A sub V, but other vent design parameters are the number of vent panels, the vent panel location relative to the ignition site, the vent deployment pressure, the mass per unit area, because it how long that determines how long it takes for the vent panel to get out of the way, and the flow discharge coefficient. Next, please. This is uh, some, uh, in, in the uh, design methodology, there are several parameters characterizing the enclosure, most important of which is the enclosure sur total surface area, A sub S, the area of the walls, floor, and ceiling. The length to diameter ratio is important because it longer L high LOBDs can promote flame acceleration, greater combustion rate. The damage threshold pressure is a key parameter. We've talked about that before. Uh, in 68, you, the pre you're designing for an event that will uh, be large enough to prevent the pressure from staying within no greater than two-thirds of the damage threshold pressure. And the total surface area of the internal equipment is also an important parameter because that uh, promotes, also promotes turbulent flame accelerations. Next, please. Uh, the gas mixture parameters are shown here, the burning velocity, the maximum pressure, closed vessel deflagration, density, burn gas ratio of specific heats, and whether you have a full volume or a partial volume gas cloud in the enclosure. Next, please. Here you uh, see a, uh, two different uh, battery energy storage facilities with uh, modules. And uh, we're going to look at a full volume versus partial volume. So next, please. You see on the left that will be coming that a full volume of flammable gas has now been generated in the uh, BESS on the left. And uh, subsequently, there's going to be an ignition that's going to threaten that enclosure unless the panels shown on the right wall are open early enough and are adequately large to relieve the pressure and prevent the damage uh, threshold pressures from occurring. Next, please. On the right, you see a partial volume uh, deflagration uh, gas cloud uh, due to a more limited amount of flammable gas being generated by one or more modules. But the same uh, issue applies is what, how much vent area do we need and uh, what are the other vent parameters to prevent structural damage from the subsequent delayed ignition of these gas clouds. Next, please. Uh, the cloud volume depends, I should point out, on the effectiveness of enclosure ventilation. Uh, that's a very important aspect that we probably should spend more time on next week, including the possible re uh, response time of emergency ventilation that's uh, actuated in response to detection of the runaway or uh, flammable gas being generated. Next, please. 
Uh, I'm, uh, these are some equations for the calculating the vent area. I'm just going to say that uh, they involve the surface area of the enclosure, the characteristics of the gas, and the P red is the uh, pressure strength. Next, please. Uh, the uh, value of the required vent area is very sensitive to the value of the burning velocity and the ratio of the internal obstruction surface area to the enclosure wall surface area. So the burning velocity is determined by, can be come out of the 9540A test. The amount of surface areas is an installation specific uh, calculated, measured and calculated parameter. Next, please. The partial volume adjustment is made after the full volume required vent area is determined by this equation. Next, please. Uh, I am going to show you a, uh, a video of a large scale vented uh, methane air deflagration test. This test was conducted also about 40 years ago, and I apologize for the graininess of the film. Uh, the, uh, before the, the actual deflagration starts, there'll be some parameters showing the size of the enclosure and the concentration of methane in it and the pressure uh, produced and the size of the vent area. You see the parameters now, and then you'll see, uh, you'll see, if you look closely, you'll see a little indication of ignition outside the enclosure, and then the vent panels will open, and you'll see the flames. Ignition, delay, flames. Thank you. Uh, next, okay, next slide is, uh, this is next to last, showing uh, a video frame in another vented deflagration. This particular uh, test was conducted by Getzcon in Bergen, Norway. It's a hydrogen air explosion, vented explosion, where a 24% hydrogen in air mixture was uh, generated in a standard size shipping container uh, that had some equipment inside. And as you can see, during the deflagration, the pr pressures are adequate to severely deform that shipping container structure. The maximum pressure here was between six and seven PSI. The, uh, the, the uh, venting occurred through the end wall of the open end wall of the shipping container. And in this test, the container was not permanently uh, ruptured, but there was permanent deformation. Next, please. Uh, this is the last slide. It shows uh, uh, that another important consideration when we're talking about deflagration venting is the size of the external fireball outside the vented enclosure. You can see on the left can be a ball or a jet flame on the right. And uh, uh, next, please, last comment is that the uh, 68 has equations to calculate the size of the fireball diameter and the external pressure distribution. And in some cases, a deflector may be needed. There's not adequate setback distance to uh, that might threaten potential targets from either the flame or the blast wave outside the enclosure. That's it for this presentation. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to turn it over to uh, Milash. Just a quick reminder, this is David from Sustainable CUNY, that if you have any questions, please write them into the chat box. We're only going to have a limited number of time uh, to answer questions today, but we'll make sure we write them down. We can discuss them in person on the 27th as well. Okay, good uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Milos Pachowski, uh, and uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for the invitation to, um, to provide some information to you on on how to apply UL 954A and the data from that to some fire protection engineering problems. Uh, in essence, or just in terms of background, uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Fire Protection Engineering up at WPI, or Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which is located in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, next slide, oh, hold on. Uh, just uh, real quickly, uh, the picture that you see there is um, a, a, a photo that I had taken uh, about a year or so ago, uh, and it just so happened I was at my daughter's soccer game, and um, it was near uh, uh, the series of windmills, and this was uh, an energy storage system that was uh, essentially adjacent to um, to the windmill there. So um, that's the background for that, that particular picture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of an agenda, um, or more of the topics that I kind of want to cover in the, in the brief time that we have this morning, 
uh, is as follows. Um, I want to uh, focus a little bit about what it means to provide fire safe facilities um, and I'll talk in, in what context that, that means. Uh, I'd like to touch a bit upon uh, fire behavior and really fire behavior in compartments because as we take these batteries, right, really any fuel source um, in the building or other structure like a container, it will be in a compartment and there is certainly going to be some compartment effects that will influence the behavior of the fire and the effects of that fire on, on other contents and, and people in, in the building. I want to touch upon regulations, uh, which is a big part of, um, of fire protection. Um, and uh, we'll talk a bit about regulations. Uh, leading to standardized testing um, and uh, the focus that that has, or the background. And I'll also talk a bit about some of the calculation methods that are available in terms of, of making decisions about fire protection. And then I'll focus on three different areas here. One is on fire spread and containment um, from whatever the fuel source might be, in this case, a uh, energy storage system, uh, a battery unit. Um, uh, we'll talk a bit about the detection and suppression systems, and then I'll touch a bit upon uh, smoke control. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of fire safety and uh, in terms of the regulations that we have, at least in the United States, uh, the bottom line really is, is the building going to be safe? Uh, and what I show you here is uh, the same building in two different conditions. Um, this was a, a, a building fire back, uh, what was the first interstate bank building uh, in Los Angeles some number of years ago. Uh, but on the left is this high rise structure at, at one point, uh, which folks would say, well, it looks pretty safe. I would certainly go into that particular building uh, because if it wasn't safe, I guess it wouldn't be open and I wouldn't be able to enter it. Uh, the building was safe, and on the right is a fire that had occurred in that particular building um, back in uh, back in 1989. Uh, so the bottom line is 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 the building safe? Um, and if as you think about that, um, you want to consider what does that mean? Um, what's safe? We're talking about life safety, property protection, business continuity, safety to the environment, uh, a number of factors that that may come come into play. I will say, from a fire protection engineering standpoint. Our goal is for the picture on the right for that really not to occur. Um, so we're putting systems and features into buildings so that that outcome on the right does not occur. However, if it does occur, there still needs to be provisions provided within the building that will serve the fire service, right, and emergency responders in how they can access that fire and hopefully extinguish that particular type of incident. Next slide, please. Uh, what I have here is just a slide, uh, and I want to first focus a bit upon fire and fire behavior before I kind of get into, into the codes and the regulations. But in terms of, as an engineer, or fire protection engineer, what you're looking at in terms of fire behavior, uh, there are certain effects or factors that, that one would consider. And some of these are being captured by the UL test method, uh, UL 9540A, among other test methods that they have. But when you look at a particular fire, there's going to be things that have become important, things like temperature, um, heat release rate, or the energy release that is going to be uh, a function of that fire. How much heat energy is that fire actually producing, and in what form does it take? And then, based upon that fire, how does that heat energy dissipate or spread to other components or other parts of that building, or even to the same fuel source? And so you'd look at things like heat flux on, in terms of how you're measuring this from a radiative uh, capacity, convective energy, or conductive energy. We're also going to look at products of combustion. Um, we talked a bit about this as, uh, as a particular, uh, at least the early part of the presentations here. Uh, what are some of these products of combustion um, as uh, a fire ensues, whether it's going to be a smoldering fire or going into flaming combustion? And at what point do those, those products of combustion uh, how do they impact the building, the occupants, um, the products, uh, and the overall enterprise that's there? And how might those products of combustion may be further or become further involved in a particular fire event, whether it's a deflagration, explosion of some type, or just uh, a, a fire, um, a fire that's burning? Uh, we'll look at things like pressure differentials. Uh, we touched upon some of those, more so from a deflagration standpoint. But even if you're not looking at a deflagration hazard, there's still pressure differentials that one would look at in terms of a fire burning in a compartment. 
because there will be pressure differentials based upon whatever your boundaries or what your control volume is, whether it's within the compartment to exterior portions of that compartment or, or, or subunits within that compartment, because uh, based upon the buoyant effects of fire and, and the, the chemistry of that particular event of combustion, these pressure differentials will influence how that fire behaves and how the products of combustion and the effects of that fire mid, um, spread through the building. It's also important to look at the compartment effects. Uh, for example, the size of the compartment in terms of its dimensional criteria. Uh, ventilation effects become critical in terms of, of ventilating or, or venting that fire. Um, will there be enough oxygen uh, present in some form to get there? Um, and the ventilation of the compartment effects can be sort of in a passive way because you've got an opening into that room or they could be mechanical. For example, if there needs to be a large amount of cooling air uh, for an operation to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to occur, okay? Uh, we'll also look at things like system discharge, right? So uh, in this effect or, or in this particular state here, uh, once a fire does occur, you're assuming you have ignition. Well, at what point do you have to sense that fire for something else to happen, your fire protection system? And once that fire occurs, um, will the system sense it? At what time does it sense it? And then how much of an agent is necessary to mitigate the effects of that fire. And here again is what are you looking for that system to do? Are you looking for it to control the fire, to suppress it, to extinguish it? Are you looking at it to abate uh, radiation effects, for example? Is it sort of a water curtain where you, you, you're trying to, to mitigate the effects of, of radiation? So the system discharge becomes important. All the factors that I've just described up above, uh, well, they're not static. Um, as you've seen, fire is, is a function of time. Things will change. So it becomes important to measure all of these different effects um, as a function of time. Next slide, please. Um, as a fire protection engineer, uh, and as was expressed earlier, the heat release rate is, is critical, right? So we need to take a look at what that heat release rate is of a particular fuel and as it spreads or the entire heat release rate of a particular compartment once, once it gets involved. Uh, what I show you here is sort of a simplistic um, or an idealized fire uh, heat release rate curve for a particular type of fire, where you can essentially look at this fire and look at its growth period of when you might have ignition, and does that fire grow with some sort of um, state, or not a steady state, but some rate in which it grows. And if that fire continues to grow, well, at some point you will reach this point of flashover, again, within a compartment. The fire becomes fully developed and uh, it flashover shortly thereafter. You would expect the greatest amount of heat release rate, the greatest temperatures to occur, uh, which poses the greatest threat uh, to the building uh, and its occupants. And at some point, depending upon the fuel, uh, you will reach this point of, of a period of decay. Now, this is an idealized curve. It doesn't actually look this smooth, and there could be a number of variations along that particular curve. But it gives you a representation of what we're trying to capture in terms of that, that heat release rate as a function of time. Also, if you look at this, uh, that heat release rate curve, you see towards the bottom there, there is a dashed line. That dashed line there is to um, represent an effect of a suppression system or some sort of firefighting system. And at what point during the initial fire growth when this fire starts, does that fire suppression system, fire control system, that firefighting system is the term I'll use here, does it have some effect on the fire? Ideally, you'd like that, that fire protection system or that firefighting system to knock down your fire such that, that that heat release rate actually goes to a point of zero or close to zero. Um, and uh, we say pretty much close to zero, uh, because many of the active systems that we have in there, we may not be able to get enough of that agent onto the actual burning members and some manual firefighting might be necessary to actually totally extinguish that particular fire. Uh, next slide, please. So what I have here is just uh, the, the next three slides uh, sort of give her a, a, a visual sort of indication of what's happening with a given fire. Okay, so the first slide here is really if, uh, if you've had some sort of ignition on the fuel source, which is shown here as your as a chair, 
uh, that fire will begin to flame, a plume will develop, a ceiling jet will develop, uh, products of combustion will begin to be produced, and that room will fill with smoke. Products of combustion, that flame will, will, continue, will continue to rise. Again, from a fire protection engineering standpoint, we try to capture certain aspects of that fire. For example, how much heat is being generated, how much of a heat flux is now being emitted to other unburned fuel surfaces in that particular room? What are concentrations of certain gases? And also, where is that fire? Where has it started in that particular room? All right, because that, that'll impact how that fire grows. Uh, if we look at some of the, the test methods that we use, for example, if we use a calorimeter of some type and we're measuring the heat release rate, it's important to take that data and note that as a particular fuel may burn under a calorimeter, that particular fuel and that fire may burn differently if I take that fuel and now put it into a compartment where there's a ceiling and walls around. And in which location do I place that particular fuel? Um, I may find that that heat release rate is different than what is actually measured early on in that calorimeter depending upon how that test method was established because of the compartment effects, the re-radiation from the walls and other surfaces in that room, as well as the amount of ventilation. How big are the openings to allow for air to come in? Also, as we look through here, there's uh, to the right, uh, where it says flames touching the ceiling, there's an opening there, right? So as products of combustion um, uh, leave the room, it's important that there be enough of an opening well, important if the fire was to continue, that oxygen or air can come into the room. And as we look at this, right, there is going to be a pressure differential that forms with relation to that compartment in other parts of that room, depending upon which sort of boundaries or control volumes uh, we want to establish. Next slide, please. So what we have here is the fire actually is, is able to grow in this particular case. Uh, we're seeing that layer descend. Uh, and as that layer descends, actually, it'll impact uh, the way that that fire actually behaves. Um, and if there's insufficient air coming into the room, not that the fire will go out, but the type of combustion will change from potentially a flaming combustion to a smoldering combustion. Um, and there's sufficient energy to continue that combustion process, but it becomes much smokier. And really what's happening for a fire to actually burn um, for most fuels, which are carbon-based, you've got to get them into a vapor state. And so there may be sufficient energy to actually vaporize the fuel or pyrolyze the fuel, uh, but there may be insufficient oxygen to actually ignite it. However, what may happen at some point because of the smoldering combustion that occurs is once somebody comes to that room and opens up another vent, uh, you could have something like a backdraft effect uh, a deflagration type effect because now all of a sudden all those gases that were essentially produced and were lacking oxygen, there's sufficient heat in that particular compartment. Now you've allowed for sufficient oxygen to come into that room and now you can get um, a, a very substantial fire effect that, that may uh, actually um, create substantial pressures and get into the range of an explosion. Uh, next, um, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, if there is sufficient uh, oxygen within the room, at some point you will reach this point of flashover. And this point of flashover was essentially where every, essentially every burning surface in that room uh, is involved in flaming combustion and it's burning. And again, this is the point where, where it becomes, um, I would say, very critical from a structural standpoint within the building to be able to, to, to withstand this. Uh, now we're also driving the, the fire is this engine that will produce these effects of heat and toxic products and smoke uh, that are much, um, that can be driven through the building because of the energy uh, through that combustion process. Um, so ideally, next slide please. What we're trying to do as a fire protection engineer is really to, to, to um, prevent the effect a flash uh, or to minimize the likelihood of, of that occurring. And this slide here is essentially a flashover effect, right? So this, uh, this particular room uh, flashed over um, based upon the, the dynamics of, of that particular type of um, fire that occurred, right? So ideally from a fire protection engineering standpoint, we'd want to be able to measure these various aspects um, and provide mitigation um, uh, measures so that this would not occur. Okay, next slide. 
So how do we deal with this um, in sort of, I'd say, not a practical way, but the way that, that we tend to practice fire protection uh, in the United States? Uh, and that is uh, primarily through regulations, whether they're building regulations or fire regulations. And the way that it works in the United States, there are a, essentially um, several organizations that produce what are called model legislation or model fire regulations, building regulations, do, uh, documents like the International Building Code or the International Fire Code, or documents by the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, such as their fire code or the Life Safety Code. And so what tends to happen is that the, the first sort of line of, of regulations that I have out there are really these model um, regulations. And it's really up to an individual state, city, county, government agency that would tend to adopt these regulations. And then they would tend to adopt them and then modify them in some way. And so while here in the United States, we've got um, essentially a couple building codes that could be used, a couple fire codes that could be used, a life safety code that are out there. Usually most of the agencies, uh, governmental authorities that adopt them will modify them to fit the needs, right, and the specific objectives for a particular geographic uh, region or area, whether it's statewide, countywide, again, citywide, or for a particular agency that, that's either a federal agency or even on a statewide agency. So we don't necessarily have a uniform set of regulations across the United States. All of those regulations and what those codes actually do, um, they will specify and they tend to prescribe safety measures. Uh, I use that term prescribe. Um, some folks refer to those as a cookbook approach. I wouldn't necessarily define any regulation as a cookbook. Um, it's not a recipe. Um, they provide a series of endpoints, criterias, provisions that are in them. And from a design standpoint, an engineering standpoint, uh, you have many different ways to comply with a regulation. And it's not a how-to book. Um, these books don't tell you how to provide a given measure of fire safety. It's really up to the engineer, the designer, or the architect, the design team to really uh, put together a package that meets the code. Because once you've met the code, you're essentially deemed to be safe. And we'll talk about what that means. Um, the bottom um, series of codes is a series of reference standards that would be referenced by these various regulations. So for example, if I want to, or, or back up a second, the building code may ask for a sprinkler system as a means of providing some level of safety. Essentially, that regulation would, again, refer to a document like NFPA 13, standing for the installation of sprinkler systems, which would give you, again, some criteria provisions in terms of discharge densities, types of sprinklers, sprinkler spacing, amount of total water that could be calculated that you would need to mitigate a particular type of hazard. So we have similar documents in terms of NFPA 72 on fire alarm and detection systems, uh, NFPA 92 on smoke management systems. And then I've also put up here another document called the SFP Handbook of Fire Protection Engineering. So as we get into some of these details, um, while we try to prescribe the solution, um, what we're finding is, well, you can't always prescribe. There's some means of calculation that might be necessary. And this document, the SFP Handbook of Fire Protection Engineering, uh, is actually a, a collection of these various calculation methods and techniques that a fire protection engineer could use to better assess a particular risk or to quantify the hazard uh, for a particular building. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, as I, I kind of indicated here, these building regulations, they serve really to legally establish the minimum criteria that must be met really by the building owners in providing health, safety, and welfare for the public in the built environment. The building is, needs to be deemed safe. And by complying with these regulations, uh, essentially, you would get that point of safety. Now, the point here is, is what is safety? Um, in my opinion, I believe that most of our regulations that are out there are really from an IBC standpoint, the fire code standpoint. Um, their first priority is really life safety to make sure that, that the people within the building are, are, are going to be safe. The degree to which it covers property protection or mission continuity, in my view, is less so. Right. Uh, the regulations would cover your neighbor's property, um, 
And but the amount of property protection that one may expect from these regulations, well, I think it's important that the building owner or the operator know what they're actually getting out of this particular regulation and assess that to see if it's sufficient for their degree of, of business continuity to maintain their particular operations. Next slide, please. Um, it's also important to note that our regulations really come um, a rooted in the 19th century. And much of what we see in our regulations, they've been there for a long time. Those provisions have been there. Um, even uh, those provisions predate really some of our, our more, um, I would say, current understanding of fire. There's been a lot of work in fire research over the last few decades uh, to inform this. Yet, uh, what's in the codes, some of this stuff has been in there for quite a period of time, uh, and it works, and it works. However, there may be other ways that you could assess a particular um, degree of fire protection that's being provided. Our regulations in general, um, they're prescribed solutions, and they really address a broad occupancy groups for generic hazards associated with that occupancy. For example, what would we expect to be in an office building? We consider that in sort of a broad way, and we look at the generic type of hazards that we would expect to be in an office building, or in a hospital, or in a hotel. And that's really how the code deals with that. And if we break out of those norms a bit, then we're forced to do potentially some other means of protection. Again, it's largely through a combination of prescriptions that the designer or the design team needs to put together to meet those prescriptions or meet the criteria associated with that. There was a heavy reliance on standardized fire testing of products and systems. Okay, so much of what we put into our regulations right now are really standardized tests, and there's a lot of test methods that are out there. And as I look through these regulations, they will call out specific test methods from different organizations, UL being one of those, okay? We also have a greater availability of calculation methods and quantitative assessment techniques that are available um, that we could potentially use as another way or to assure or to get a better comfort level of the type of protection scheme that's being proposed. Next slide, please. So I wanna focus on the next couple of slides is what the regulations actually get into. Things like building construction, size, structural resistance, fire containment. They may specify different types of active systems, sprinklers, standpipe, water mist, clean agent systems, for example, detection, emergency power, smoke management. Next slide, please. They also focus a great deal on means of egress, how the building is arranged so that occupants can get to a point of safety, whether it's to egress the building entirely or to go to other places within the building that are safe. Uh, there's also provisions in there to provide for access so the fire service can work their way into the building to fight a particular type of fire. And then the last bullet there is building contents and processes, right? Looking at specific areas, right? Things like hazardous areas. And so now when we're looking at things like energy storage systems, right? We would consider that, or the regulations typically would look at that as some type of a hazardous area in a generic occupancy or a broad occupancy like an office building or a hotel or some other type of facility or building that you want to put in this other type of, of um, uh, process or material. Next slide, please. It's so important to, to note um, is, or, or you ask yourself this question is, is will ignition occur? And if we look at the regulations, the safety measures that are provided in there really assume that you're going to have ignition, that you're igniting whatever fuel source is gonna be in that building and you want to, or the building code, the regulation wants to provide provisions around the fact that you're gonna have ignition. And what do you do about that to provide uh, an acceptable level of safety? Okay, so the regulations for the most part assume that ignition will occur. Next slide. Uh, and looking at this, we've got uh, features of building construction that are in play. So for example, whatever's burning, um, initially in these regulations, uh, much of this was sort of passive fire protection, where you're trying to provide some degree of fire resistance, right, to contain that fire within the room, to provide some fire barrier, a smoke barrier, which is a different type of wall, a smoke partition, and it has some degree of fire resistance, which is measured through a standardized test. It's also important that buildings stand up. So there's structural fire resistance based upon, well, what type of fire do you expect that building to be subjected to? And the building regulations will specify the structural frame or the structural stability of that building in some degree of fire resistance. 
as well as for the floor construction and the roof construction. So those are specified in some way, and those are really linked to some standardized fire test method to help evaluate that. Next slide. Suppression systems. I've got a picture here in the next couple slides of sprinkler systems. So these particular slides, and what I want to show you here is a sprinkler system. It's important to understand a sprinkler system is not just one type of sprinkler system. There's many design features that one can design into that sprinkler system. It's not one size fits all. There's a lot of engineering that goes into these types of systems. It's also important to note that for most part, the sprinkler system, only the sprinkler nearest the fire is activating. And so it becomes important to recognize, well, what's the discharge? How much pressure is needed from that particular sprinkler? What size orifice is needed to get some type of an effect? Fire control, suppression, whatever the case might be. The total quantity of water becomes important, which is why I have that tank there. How much water needs to be available to control that fire, to provide the mitigating effect? Next slide, please. Um, in the interest of time, I'll skip over this, this particular slide. So next slide, please. Um, real quickly on this slide, and what becomes important with a sprinkler system or really any suppression system is how much of that firefighting agent, in this case, water, do you need? And the way that we deal with this from a sprinkler standpoint is looking at the hazard, whether it's a light, ordinary, or extra hazard, to determine how much water and density, GPM, per square foot over some operating area do you need to get the desired effect? Next slide, please. Also, depending upon the type of sprinkler, there are many different types of sprinklers on the marketplace these days. The uh, way that we determine the amount of water or the amount of water that's needed changes for the different types of sprinklers that are out there. In this case, this would be an early suppression, fast response type of, 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 of sprinkler criteria that we have. Next slide, please. I want to just touch upon smoke management and smoke control. So in this particular case, um, what we're really looking at here is, uh, is there a way to mitigate or control the flow of smoke? And there are techniques that are available that you could do that by, again, having different pressure differentials over different boundaries in your building, right? And so as a fire burns, it generates smoke. It generates a positive pressure. So is there a way through mechanical systems to mitigate the flow or to better control or to redirect that smoke through the building? There are methods available to do that. Next slide. Another aspect of this, not so much I wouldn't expect here in, in terms of, of energy storage systems, but in terms of, um, of, of smoke management, there are also techniques for, for looking at how a fire Fire uh, would develop a smoke plume and spread up through a building, and how we might exhaust that particular amount of smoke to keep it what this uh, picture here is above people's heads or some other criteria. Again, an important aspect here is what's the heat release rate, which will be measured uh, as part of the, um, the UL testing. Next slide. Uh, the next couple slides are equations here, um, and we can go through this slide in the next slide. Uh, you can move through here. But the important point here is that there are these equations that are there, and the item Q that is indicated there is really the heat release rate that one would need to help um, or to, to, to factor into these equations. Next slide, please. Um, there are various modeling techniques that are available. Um, one technique that, that is quite popular these days is to use a computational fluid dynamics model, a CFD model. Uh, one, it's largely available from the U.S. government. It's called FDS. And really what that model is, it's very good at predicting the effects of fire. So if I know the heat release rate um, and the geometry of the building, I can enter this in and I can look at the effects of that particular fire and determine what temperatures and what the fire effluent might be and how it might spread through the building. We have pretty good confidence with that. Once we try to use the CFD model to actually model fire growth, we're less confident. We're also less confident in terms of how this type of model, if we actually enter a suppression system, to determine how that suppression system might actually interact with the fire to determine the effect of that suppression system on that particular fire. Our understanding of the physical phenomenon isn't quite where it needs to be to, to, to have um, a great degree great deal of confidence in this particular method using a CFD model. Next slide. So um, the next slide that I have here is uh, is a, a particular product, a project 
uh, that we were involved with here at WPI a short while ago. And it really had to do with looking at energy storage systems. In this case, it was really looking at the energy storage system uh, within a container unit and how it might spread to other container units. Really what this was, was an exercise in radiation heat transfer. And while we particularly focused on the entire um, energy storage uh, uh, container being involved, you can look at this if you had sufficient data from a unit level or a module level to look at, at how that fire might spread, looking at radiation heat transfer analysis or convective heat transfer analysis within that compartment or a segment of that particular compartment if we had data available to, to, do, to do this. Next slide, please. Uh, and actually, I'm going to skip over this slide. Uh, next slide, please, because that just sort of highlights the various aspects of the UL uh, test method that, that would be available. So again, I, I've, I've put this slide in here really because depending upon what point of the analysis one engineer might be into, they're going to be looking at either from a cell level, a module level, a unit level, or the entire installation level to try to take data from the cell or the module test to help inform through these calculations what might happen right as we do this so for example this is uh actually the installation test but if i look at just the units right that's also part of the unit test and the engineer or as you go back to ul for this you have to come up with some of these spacing criteria for the h dimension the d dimension right so some of the data you would obtain from the module test may be useful from this or from the first run of this unit test to help inform uh, or obtain data for these equations that are needed. The same thing would apply with um, the sprinkler system that's shown here, right? You need to in inform or provide some data about the discharge from that sprinkler system to make sure that that sprinkler system or any other suppression system would be effective. And again, what do you mean by effective? Spread from one unit to another, spread within the unit, spread um, throughout the entire container or the compartment, or once it, that entire compartment is involved, what, what, what are the, the actual aspects of this analysis that, that you're looking at? Next slide, please. Um, and again, this was some uh, from a previous project that we had looked at, but essentially looking at the inside of one of these container units, right? What aspect of the analysis do you need to look at? And how do you inform, right, and run these calculations so that every test that you do, that you're really maximizing the efficiency, right, of that particular test method as you move through these various phases of uh, the UL test method. Next slide, please. Again, this, uh, what, what this shows here is really we assumed that this particular analysis that the container was burning, that, that it actually broke through the container uh, because of the venting that was there, and we looked at the radiation heat transfer analysis to, to various units. Again, next slide, please. There's various equations, and I won't spend much detail on these, but these various equations as we go through here can be broken down, and we can look at these at a smaller level as we're trying to determine what the fire is spreading from what surface to the other right in this case it becomes important to know what the radiating heat flux would be uh, which is a function of the temperature of the surfaces of the flames which again could be part of what would be measured in this ul test method next slide please um it becomes important to look at these view factors right it becomes and again this is focusing on radiation but looking at what is emitting the energy and what is absorbing the energy and at what point is there some failure mechanism which would also be captured right uh you can go to the next slide please uh, as well as to the next slide um in this particular case uh again what becomes important is what are these maximum temperatures if we're going to do this heat transfer analysis how confident are we in the methods right in this particular case for this example we assume the fire in that compartment would reach a certain temperature based upon the ventilation that we would expect through that container because we looked at various types of ventilation rates now does this method particularly apply to all cases no but it needs to be analyzed that's the type of information that would be needed next slide please um we're also looking at essentially what the overall heat release rate would be next slide um in the interest of time and i'm going kind of uh, quick here but we'd also want to look at the flames what are the flame temperatures 
in terms of how much energy would be emitted. And again, this is the type of data that would uh, would be useful um, from the, the UL test method. Uh, next slide, uh, which also goes into what our thermal thresholds would be, which is also being captured uh, through through some of the testing um, of, uh, of the UL test method. Uh, and I think at this point, because uh, I think uh, you've gone over uh, what I'm supposed to go over, but uh, I guess I'll pause over here and, and hand this back over to, to, to Thea. Hi, folks. All right. Uh, thanks. I know you've, <laughs> you've recovered an awful lot of uh, information, and we've had a bunch of questions come in, and I'm cognizant that we've only got about oh, about eight minutes left. So the team is unmuting everybody as we speak, and um, I'll ask you if you're not if you're not speaking, please put yourself on mute so we don't get too much feedback. And I'm just going to hand it over very quickly to Victoria, who can start to take us through some of the questions that have already come come up. Victoria, Carrie, are you there? Ah, thank you. I think I was just unmuted. Hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies for that technical problem. Um, thanks to all of the presenters. I think that this presentation has been particularly useful in, um, you know, educating us all on the phone as well as preparing us for for next. Uh, conversation in depth. Um, so as Tria noted, we've got a lot of questions and we won't unfortunately have time to go through all of them today. Um, but I did want to start um, thank you, Milosh, particularly um, on, on uh, your opinion relating to um, acceptance criteria um, and, and how, how particular uh, levels of, of risk are assessed. Um, so I think a question that's come up a lot is, you know, how, how can folks design their systems and their protection systems to a sufficient level that's acceptable um, when there's perhaps not a, a directly applicable code as, as of yet um, in place? And in many places it says, unless full-scale testing demonstrates otherwise. Um, so looking to get to a point where uh, system designers and, and, and safety and protection system designers can um, help to appropriately protect these systems, trying to understand how can we get to acceptance criteria and, and how um, acceptable levels of risk are determined in buildings, if you have any clarity on that. Uh, sure, well, I, I could try. Uh, again, I think it, it becomes important to, to recognize, well, what do you mean by safe, right? And so from uh, a traditional building code standpoint, right, we're, we're looking at if someone were to go into an office building or any other type of building, we're talking about safety in terms of will will occupants be able to leave? Can they get to a point of safety? So if I look at a document like the life safety code, it's only concerned about life safety. Can I get people away, right? And so what happens to the building in theory really isn't, isn't part of the equation. Now that changes somewhat as I get to the building code and fire codes, right, where they're, where they're looking at that. But uh, it is important to, to try to establish what do you mean by safe? Right. And so what we mean by safe typically is, well, if we put on a sprinkler system and I'm going off a sprinkler standpoint. Right. If we put a sprinkler system in the building, it's related to NFPA 13. And we know that there are certain discharge densities or criteria of discharge that have been proven to be effective. That fire can be controlled or suppressed with that particular type of system. And therefore, there's a great deal of confidence placed upon that particular type of, of, of system. And so there has been a number of ways that that's been um, sort of accumulated over time, right, um, over the past 100 or more than 100 years of when sprinklers were, were in effect. But even to this date, there, there are some products, uh, the way they're stored, that, that we're not quite certain as to what discharge density is, is available, right, to for it to suppress that. So that's just one aspect, but it becomes important to really get some agreement as to what that criteria is. If it is a suppression system, what do you expect that suppression system to do? Put the fire out, um, mitigate it, right? Control it to a certain heat release rate uh, until the fire department gets there. If the fire department does get there, can they actually put the fire out? And then how much water is necessary? To actually do that, right? So those are the type of, of issues um, that that would need to be tackled. 
Great, thank you for talking us through that. I think that really does get to the, the core of where questions are coming from. Um, essentially, you know, what 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 is the equivalent, what is safety? Um, that that is the, what is that acceptable level of safety and, and, and what are you trying to protect? Um, so thank you, and I think that certainly will have uh, much more discussion on that point next Monday. Um, we did have some, uh, some technical questions that came up. Um, one of them uh, was regarding uh, some of the impacts of uh, calculations that were discussed in the first slide deck um, around how uh, a fire ball uh, diameter was, was uh, calculated. Uh, I'm not sure uh, who was speaking at the exact time of that question came up. Uh, this is Bob. I'm, I'm the one who talked about uh, fireballs size and uh, so if the question is how is the fireball size calculated uh, the answer is to uh, look at nfpa 68 there's a particular equation there to calculate the size of the fireball based on the volume of the enclosure and the uh, combustion properties and that equation came from uh, some large-scale testers of empirical correlation so I'll, I'll leave it go with that. If anybody wants the details, we can talk about that offline. But it's a, it's a simple equation in the Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Clarity is appreciated. Um, another question came through uh, regarding, and I believe we discussed this last week, um, but I think it's valuable to get some clarity. Um, there was some discussion around uh, measuring gas uh, that has come out of a unit under test um, in an oxygen-free environment um, or a low oxygen environment. Um, and the, the question that was raised is, is that the gas composition that would be utilized to determine parameters uh, such as flame speed or, um, and, and then how that's impacted in the NFPA phase of calculation? Yep. Yeah, well, I'll talk with <clears throat> that answer. Uh, this is Alfonso. Uh, so, so we actually have done that type of testing uh, here at Exponent, and uh, the the way that we have done it is instead of inerting the atmosphere around it, we vacuum the chamber and and have the gases sort of gas into a vacuum. And the reason is, if you have air or if you have oxygen in that vessel, uh, there's a good chance that gas will ignite during the uh, event. So you will not, what, what you measure, the gases are the combustion products. So mostly uh, CO2 and whatever uh, uh, remnants uh, from combustion. But really the hazard uh, for, for deflagration comes from the unburned gases. And there, there is a possibility for those gases to build up to, to a significant size before you ignite. So it's a really, uh, measuring the unburned gases and their properties is the conservative uh, measurement that, that should be uh, obtained. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I, I will have to drop at uh, 11.30, but uh, Tria will continue on with the questions. Um, the, the last question that I'll, I'll uh, begin uh, discussion on was, uh, there was a mention in one of the presentations regarding um, how how suppression systems could be um, uh, essentially validated uh, after uh, during a, a testing event, and uh, it was it was noted that um, modeling wouldn't be able to determine um, if that suppression system would be functional. Essentially, there there would be required to be um, a test. And a question that's come up a lot with um, many of the folks on this call is if it's possible to utilize the results of a full-scale installation test um, and apply it to other types of installations, so potentially different configurations. Um, so clarity on that point uh, would be would be great. Um, this is Milosh. Um, so I guess there's there's sort of two parts there. One. You know, on on the effectiveness of of the suppression system, you know, while there there is some, you know, I would call the research work, um, you know, investigative work on on trying to do that, and that, and that's been a subject, uh, 
right, of discussion for many years is, 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 is there really a, a mathematical model? I mean, in theory there is, but it's, it's very complex, right, in terms of, of, of how you would actually use a calculation method to determine um, how much, for example, sprinkler discharge and in what form that takes. Right. And, and over the years, uh, there have been a number. I mean, there have been so many uh, developments in sprinkler technology in terms of orifice size of sprinklers and deflector designs that will influence the size, the momentum, uh, the speed of these droplets and their, their areas of coverage um, in terms of how they interact with heat from a fire, right? Because they're evaporating, they're removing heat from that fire. It's a, it's a very complex phenomenon uh, that, that one is trying to, to approximate numerically. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's just very, it's a very complex situation. So while there may be tools that will, will help inform, you know, a decision about that, I mean, ultimately, even when it comes to other types of products that one may want to use, it, we've really relied upon full-scale testing to do that. Now, to the second part of that is really how might this be scalable, right? So if, if you were able to take this and you've passed a, a particular test, it really, ha uh, you know, for, for example, a particular type of installation, well, what are the parameters, right? What are the sensitivities of taking that particular that particular accepted test and applying them to others and i think there's you know that's ideally what you would like to do but there, there's a fair amount of examination that would need to go in terms of what are all of the sort of these sensitivity factors um scalability factors um and really what what drives that what you know what factors become more important than others as you as you try to take a, a potentially successful outcome and apply it elsewhere um so um it's uh, it's an interesting question, and and I think one where you know I think uh, I think what I'd like to be um, is is to be able to do this numerically and take what we do know and and apply some sort of numerical technique, a model of some type, um, to to apply it right to to a broader spectrum. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll leave it there for now. Thank you for that answer. Yeah. Um, so I, in the interest of time, because I recognize we've passed 1130, um, what we're going to do is take the uh, take the questions that have come in, and we're going to get them into the Google Doc, and we'll we'll circle back with our our speakers and ask them if they can help us answer those um, ahead of the the 27th, and and try to use that um, as some guidance for conversation. Um, so again, I you know thanks everyone for putting in your questions, and please jump on that Google Doc and, and feel free to add more because it will certainly help focus our conversation on the 27th. And I think, you know, getting at these questions of, of criteria and specification are, 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 are clearly a, a component of what we've been, been hearing to date. So with that, um, and I'm, I'm also getting a little echo here, so I hope you guys can all hear me. Um, I'm going to conclude this webinar and we will all be uh, uh, talking to each other via email, and then we will see many of you um, on the 27th. And again, please register if you have not already. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here with us this morning. Thank you so much to our presenters for taking the time to, to help us with uh, this application of data uh, uh, bucket, and we'll look forward to continued conversation. Have a great day. Thank you.